started this evening with 332. 332, my Jesus, I love thee. Good to see you all here this evening at Anchor Baptist Church. We're going to get started at 332, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. Stand and we'll sing. 332. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If326, more about Jesus. More about Jesus. The more you know about Jesus, the more you ought to love him. The better you get to know him, the closer you ought to get. 326, more about Jesus would I know. 326, more about Jesus. Jesus would I know more of his grace to others show Jesus in his word, holy. 
in communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. More and more about Jesus, more and more about Jesus. on his road, riches and glory all his own, more of his kingdom sure increase, more of his coming prince of peace, more, more about Jesus, more, more about Jesus. Y'all can be seated, Brother Hanson. How's everybody doing? Andy, will you open us in prayer, please? Okay, we don't have much to add from this morning. However, we need to pray for the pastor. He was in a minor accident on the way home. And uh, I think his uh, material things got damaged more than anything else. Uh, he's been trying not to buy a vehicle. Oh, well. So keep him in prayer. Make sure they're all healthy and all. And uh, Lift your pastor up on a daily basis so that the, he can get the medical field working in his favor and get some progress done. Um, he was in a health group, and uh, you had to have an appointment for this, appointment for that, and you had to be within the medical group, and the medical group was so crowded that you were six, seven months out. So, and that's not really what you want to, especially when you're an octarian, and uh, he is. So, Anybody have anything else? All right, well, let's pray for uh, Ben tonight as he preaches, and um, we'll do that now. Father, we just thank you. We, we'd like you to come before us here now as we uh, lift your word up, Father, that we uh, want to give you honor and praise and glory. And Lord, we thank you for having the ability right now to do that, and we thank you again in Jesus' name. One of these days we're going to do all creatures of our God and King, but it's not going to be this Sunday. It's a good song, but the, I kind of get lost in the hallelujahs. Let's do number 40 in your hymnal. Number 40. Great is thy faithfulness in the red. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. And stand and we'll sing number 40. Put your, put your heart into it. Number 40. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been Morning, but morning, no mercies I 
seem. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning no mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me Amen. Y'all can be seated. We have a Clark family special. A special Clark family. I get to sing on this one. You got me, you got me to chuck good. <clears throat> so, so this, uh, the, the, we picked this song up from Arsenic and Old Lace which was a uh, play made into a movie, um, which is a comedy. Anybody seen Arsenic and Old Lace? All right, but well, this is what the old ladies that used to poison everybody sang. They were Methodists. Well, I guess no one's going to watch it now that you've ruined the movie. And it's a participation this song. A, this is a hymn that's in the hymnal. It just happens to be in the play. <laughs> All right, got to clarify this. Like to know the plot twist too? Yes. Are you ready? Are you going to kick us off this time? Yes. Yes. She's going to kick off. This is a participation song. Yeah. We're going to clap our hands. Yes. Joseph already started. He doesn't have me up very loud, but that's probably for a reason. All right, let's go. Oh, 
Thank you, Joseph. Let's hope he's not preaching anything real serious after that. Arsenic and Old Lace is one of my favorite movies. So it's, it's a strange movie. It's a good movie, but it's a strange movie. Um, oh my! Oh, I tell you, clapping just doesn't really work in this church, does it? I, I, yeah, now you know what I was going through this morning, trying to lead singing. Thank you, sir. Don't stab you. Okay. I, de I tend to not do that. We're good church members. You don't want to get them down. Um, I was going to say something, man. It has gone out my head. Your church, yeah, this church doesn't have rhythm. God bless us. Joseph has the best rhythm. Joseph was on key. I couldn't hear the left side of the church, but Joseph was the only one on the right side that I could tell that was on beat. Good job. <laughs> if you, um, I don't know much about being classically trained in um, instruments. But if you notice, people who have classical training tend to not smile while they play. And that's, they teach you that because they want you to focus on what you're playing and nothing else. So if the audience is clapping off beat, you can still keep time. So you're like, man, you know, the pianist, why is the pianist? Well, they might be well trained, and that's what they teach you is folk, you're, you're, you're focusing on that music. You're playing that music. You're not, your attention isn't anywhere else. And you need it. All right, Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah, after we go from a happy land far, far away, we're going to go to Jeremiah. But not, a, not a, a typical direction with Jeremiah. Hopefully it's this encouragement to you tonight. Um, but Jeremiah chapter 9. Stan, we're going to read a couple. We're going to read two quick verses in Jeremiah chapter nine. Look down here in verse twenty-three. 
Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 20, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, you let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, God. We need you, Father. I pray you just bless us. I'm trying to preach this, Lord. I pray it be a help to your people, Lord. I pray it would touch them more where they need to be touched and give them what they need, Father, and be a help to your people, Lord. We just go through this life and go through this world, Lord, and doing the best we can to serve you. Lord, I pray that you please help. Bless this time, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah gives three things here. He says, you know, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, uh, because if you're a wise man, eventually that'll fail you. So let not the uh, mighty man glory in his might, because eventually that'll fail you. And let not the rich man glory in his riches, because you can't take those with you. He says, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. And that's something a lot of Christians can miss. Uh, your walk with God is a relationship. And in a relationship, you have two people who are getting to know each other better all the time. The longer you're in a relationship, the more you know the other person. I got people, I, I got a, one of my uh, friends I had growing up, I've known him for 12 years about now, and I can anticipate what he's going to say. I know how he thinks because I know him that well. We've been around each other so much, I lived with him for about a year, I know him. Uh, Michelle, I've been married two and a little more than two years now. And, uh, and she's nervous now. She's walking out and she heard it. But we're in a relationship. And you learn each other. And you get to know each other better all the time. But we've, we talk to people who've been married for a long time. They say, well, we've been married 15, 20 years. And I learned something new about my wife yesterday. I learned something new about my husband yesterday. I didn't know you were like that. I didn't know you didn't like that. I didn't know you'd been there and done that. Oh, yeah, I never told you. What is that? That's a relationship. You just you be with each other, and you may never know each other perfectly, but after a while, you start to know each other. You get to understand each other, and that's what God wants with you. He wants you, He wants to be known and understood, and He wants His people to get in line with Him and have that relationship with Him. So, if you want to glory, glory in this, glory in knowing and understanding God, and He gives three traits here about God that He wants you to understand about Him, and God is not some phantom, unknowable force up in the sky. He's not, he's not a, a long, a gray-bearded old man sitting on a harp, or sitting on a cloud playing a harp. God has a personality. God cares about things. There are things that affect his heart. There are things that will get to God faster than other things. If you want to get his attention, there's ways to get God's attention. When you start praising him, you'll get his attention. You start lifting God up, God will come down and meet with you. You uh, start praying and fasting, that will get God's attention. God, I care so much about this, that I, I care more about this than I care about eating today. God goes, that must be very important to you. If that's that important to you, I'm going to listen a little, little closer. I'm going to work a little more. I'm going to do a little bit more about this. Uh, but in here, he gives three things. He says, I want you to know this about me. I want you to know what kind of a God I am. We're going to take this, we're going to run New Testament references on this, but I've been reading this the other night in my reading, and it really jumped out. Of, this is what God wants you to know about him. Uh, the first one, he says, and let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which, ex which exercise loving kindness. And that's the first thing God wants you to know, is to say, hey, loving kindness now, there's kindness, and the whole world now is on this big kindness kick, or this big nice kick, where you just got to be nice to everybody, and you got to be kind, be kind, be kind. I'm not against being kind. There's a law of kindness in the Bible. But the kind of kindness that's in this world is just, don't make anyone ever feel bad, ever. Well, that's not loving kindness. That's, you got to mix that love in with that kindness. I don't want you to feel bad, but I want to help you. I don't ever want to hurt you. And trying to help you, but sometimes you need to be told something like, well, you know, this ain't exactly the right way to go. But when I do it, my goal isn't to, let's stick you, let me show you exactly how wrong you are. The goal is, well, no, I, I love you, I don't want to hurt you, I want to help you, I want you to be better. I care about you. And that's what God 
That's how God feels about you and I. He has loving kindness towards us. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Loving kindness. Don't forget about the loving kindness of God the Father. You say, well, it doesn't always feel loving kind. It is. And there are things that you'll go through in life and things that you'll endure and things you'll say, well, Lord, why am I going through this? Why am I dealing with this? I thought you were kind and gentle and loving and meek and all these different things. Why, why is everything so hard? And you give it a couple of years, and you give it some time, and you give it prayer, and you just wait on the Lord, and eventually you'll look back and say, Lord, thank you for that. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like it. I didn't want it. I would never have picked it, but I'm glad that I got through it because it helped me love you more and love others more and to be better for you. Ephesians chapter 4, look it down in verse 31. It says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Be kind to each other. Care about each other. See, if somebody's caring, they're talking about something you don't care about, okay, well, give them some grace. Put up with them. Not everybody in this church is exactly like you. You got to, what do you have to work with? You got to work with, with what's in this room. Sunday night crowd, well, what do we have? Well, I don't have a this or a that, or I want this. Or, well, you don't have it. So you're going to have to be kind to each other. You're going to have to get along with each other. Why? Because we're brethren. And we work together together. We work better together as a unit than we do as a bunch of individuals. You need each other. And you want to be kind to each other. You want to care about each other. You want to love each other. Be kind, tenderhearted. It's not always, well, suck it up, buttercup. You know, oh, that sounds, oh, okay, you had a rough week. Well, yeah, we all had rough weeks. Get over it. Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> That's, there's a toughness to this. I'm not going to tell you you're not in boot camp. I mean, that's what church is supposed to be is boot camp. But there's going to be times where you say, look, I know I'm just complaining, but I just got to get this off. I just need someone to just listen to me complain for a while so I can get it out of my system and then go on with my life. All right, get it out. Get to, but you need somebody to be tenderhearted to be able to do that and to say, okay, well, listen, you know, I understand that this isn't everything that you wanted, but very kindly, just picking them back up and saying, well, we'll give it another week. We'll give it another week. We'll put one more foot in front of the other. You're going to be all right. And sometimes that's all it is. It's just one more week. Look, can you make it one more week? Can you be here next Sunday? I'll be here next Sunday. Okay, be here next Sunday. And is it going to be discouraging? There's going to be, it's going to be discouraging. But let me tell you, you may not always feel tender hard, but when you're down, you're going to want somebody else to be tender harder towards you. And you don't know what anybody else has gone through in the last week. We all go out into that world, and we come back Wednesday night. You don't know what happened the last three days at work. Uh, if something really bad happens to me, I generally don't say anything about it. If I'm really going through something, I usually will not talk about it. Uh, the general rule of thumb is that if I can joke about it, it doesn't matter. So if I'm joking about something, you guys, like, oh, it's, I'm fine with it. If I can be funny with you, we're fine. If I, if I can joke with you, don't ever do you know, or something. No, I'm fine. But when it's serious, it's like, okay, I'm, I kind of close it down and don't bring it up. But I'm not going to tell, well, how are you doing? Well, I'm really struggling with this. This is really weighed on me this week. And it's, okay, brother, good to see you too. It's not always going to be obvious. That's why you got to be kind and tenderhearted to each other. So that when whatever somebody's gone through, they know that when they come into church, they can get some help from each other to love each other. Why? Because that's how God is with us. He's tenderhearted towards us. And you're not always going to feel like, well, that person deserves tenderhearted. Oh, well, there's, there's, here comes somebody complaining again. Okay. You've complained a time or two. I've complained a time or two. I have a gift for it. You can't use it because it's a sin. You know, the people complain that it displeased the Lord. Sometimes they just want to complain. I'm really good at it. I can complain about anything all the time. People say, you know, I ask people, how are, you, how are you doing? Oh, can't complain. You can't complain. I can always complain. I shouldn't complain. God's been way for good, too good to me to be, for me to complain, but I can always complain. And you, what do you need? You need someone to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. What's that? That's God's attitude towards Christian. He's kind. He's tenderhearted. He's forgiving towards us. Why? Wow, he forgave all your sins. He can put up with you a little bit, and he wants you to put up with each other a little bit. 
just be gentle, be loving, be kind, be a friend, be a help. Know that, hey, I'm, I'm here. Is there anything I can do to help? And you, you ask somebody, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. That's the first response. I'm fine. You ask anybody in here, how are you doing? I'm fine, 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 I'm fine. Okay, how are you? Are you, you, you good? Are you really fine? Are you really doing all right? Well, or you just take the little extra effort, the little extra push, the little extra try, to just try and be a blessing. If you thought about what could I do to be a blessing to somebody else? How could I encourage somebody looked real down last week? How, what could I do to help that person lift, him, lift them up, help them grow, help them just what? Just be kind to them. Why? Because God's loving kind towards us. He's good to us. Look up in chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, down in verse 27. Uh, we'll start in 25. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. The Lord cherishes the church. And that's, what is that? That's, that's a special, tender love that he has towards those of you that are saved. I believe everybody in here is saved this evening. But that's a special, kind, tender, he's got a special place in his heart for his church. He died for it, and it means something to it. He cherishes it. And what does he tell you to do? He says, well, husbands, you're supposed to love your wives, because God cherishes, you ought to cherish your wife the way that God cherishes the church. And you think about your relationship with your wife, you think about the people that you care about, the people that you love, you ought to love the people in the church like that. Why? Because God loves them like that. God's tender. God, think, God has a special place for them. God cares about you specially. I know we don't always like to preach about, oh, well, you're special. But God does care about you specially. God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be close to you. He wants to walk with you. He wants, uh, the Bible talks about the Abraham being the friend of God. Well, that's not the only friend God ever wanted. He wants to be close to you. But it's not going to work unless you want to be close to him too. And that's how a relationship works. You have one person who's putting all the work in, and it's not going to last. God puts all the work into to your relationship with him, and God's constantly doing this and doing this, and you don't ever do anything back, well, that's a one-sided relationship. Eventually, God's going to let you go your own way. He's not going to unsave you. He's not going to take it away, but he's going to let you go out on your own. He's going to try and pull you back in, but he's going to let you go out on your own. Why? Because he loves you so much, he cherishes you. you. You matter to him. You're important to him. The church is, he cares about it. He cares about it as much as he loves his own flesh. In John 17, it says that, we ought to love each other as much as Jesus Christ loves God, or as much as God the Father loves Jesus Christ. Oh, well, hold on. That much? Yeah, that much. Well, what did Jesus Christ do for us? Well, Jesus Christ died for us. Are you willing to die for your brethren? I mean, okay, well, I'd take a bullet for him. Okay, well, would you live for him? Would you do something to help? What would you do to help him? What do you do to, to show that you care? And we all say, oh, well, I care, I care. Well, if something came up, I'd do something. Well, why does something have to come up for you to do something? Why do you have to wait for tragedy to strike before we want to do something nice for somebody? Hey, you know, if something happens, you set up a meal train, that's a blessing. There's been a lot of different meal trains set up for a lot of different people, a lot of, for a lot of different, that's a blessing. But that not ought to be the only time that you ever do anything nice for anybody else in the church. You know, the only time you ever try and be a blessing to somebody else, you ought to be there to encourage each other, to build each other up. You don't have to wait for somebody to fall to try and build them back up. Help them grow. Care about them. Love them. Get close to them. You know, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in what? In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You're supposed to nurture and admonish your children the way that God nurtures and admonishes you. Well, is God gentle with you? Yeah. Why? He's got his loving kindness with you, and that nurtures you as a Christian. That ought to sustain you as a Christian all the time since you go to God, and you expect to get a whooping, and he just takes care of you. 
uh, you ever do something wrong and then say, God, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that, and then he blesses you just to show you that he's not still mad at you? Just to say, I know you messed up, and I wish you hadn't messed up, but I care about you still. Man, that's the goodness of God. That'll bring you to repentance more than anything else. Yeah, I know I did it wrong, and I'm sorry, and I should have. And God says, well, you know, I've got to deal with this now. I've got to do damage control with this. But you got your heart right about it, and I just want you to know I'm not still mad at you. And that's how God doesn't hold grudges. You get it under the blood, it's gone. And sometimes God will be a little extra good to you just to remind you that it's gone. It's all right. I still love you. Why? He's trying to nurture and admonish you. He says, hey, yeah, I know it was wrong. God will convict you when you're wrong. Uh, if something happens, you're right, and you go, oh, God, is this punishment? Look, if it doesn't it come across your mind when it happens, it's probably not punishment. When you've done wrong and God has to smack you upside your head, you know what you did. You know right away, I, whoop, I, I know why this happened. <laughs> I know why I'm changing a tire on the side of the road at 7.30 in the morning this morning. I did something I shouldn't have done and got it to get my attention. Yes, Lord, I know. I'm sorry. All right. Well, work on it. Don't let it happen again. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. But nurturing, that's a lot better than I deserve. He'll admonish you, but he'd much rather just be loving and kind towards you. I mean, isn't it more fun to be around somebody when you're not fighting with them? Isn't it better to be with somebody when you're getting along and just just walking together in fellowship? Well, that's what God wants, and he wants love, the loving kindness. He cares about you. It's important to him. It's your relationship with him. It's a personal relationship. He, he's a friend. And it, it says in Jeremiah, it says his loving kindness and his judgment. Say, oh, well, here comes the judgment. Here comes the heavy. Here comes the wrath. Here comes the hammer. It's, that's not always the case. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. you got a personal relationship with your Father, your Heavenly Father. He's there always, and he, this is his nature. This is how he wants you to understand him. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and he's talking about the Lord's Supper down here in, in uh, verses uh, 20 through 30. Yeah, but it says uh, in verse 28, it says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. You say, oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, but look at the next verse. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Listen, you want to avoid the judgment of God? <laughs> judge yourself. Lord, what did I do? One of, uh, I forget who said it, but uh, it was an old preacher, and he said, keep short accounts with God. He, didn't, he says it, but he didn't come up with that, I don't think. somebody. He says it a lot, though. What should you do as a Christian? Lord, I messed up. Get it right. <laughs> Lord, I messed up. Okay, if you keep messing up, keep getting it right. But don't have all this stuff, I know I, I know I shouldn't have done that, but I did, and I know I shouldn't have done that. Get it, confess, get it under the blood, and get past it. Because you got sin that you know you're doing and you know it's wrong, it's going to build up. That's the Bible talks about you treasuring up wrath against yourself. You're build, what are you doing? You're building it up and you're building it up and you're building it up and you're building it up. Hey, if you just judge yourself and say, I know I'm wrong. I, Lord, I need help. <laughs> Lord, that's what God cares about is the heart. God, I know this is wrong. I need help. Okay. And Christian, that's what we're supposed to do with other Christians. Somebody comes to you and say, listen, I'm struggling with this. Well, don't be around my kids. I don't want you around my family like that. I don't, you're, no, you're supposed to help them. You're supposed to care about them. Why? Because they matter to God. And you're gonna, they're going to fall today, and you're going to fall tomorrow, and you're going to wish that someone was there to help you get up, because when you mess up, what do you want? You want everybody to forgive you, and you want everybody to move on. You don't want people to hold that over your head, and you don't want it to be constantly reminded of this thing. So what do you do? Well, judge yourself. Look at this book. Read it. Go to um, James chapter 1. 
James chapter 1. Get to know God and say, you know what, Lord, I don't think you're pleased with this in my life. Lord, are you? I mean, that's the beauty of it is you don't have to guess on this stuff. You don't have to say, Lord, is this wrong? Is this wrong? I really don't know. God, I can't tell. Maybe I should. Lord, please show me, and he will. Why? Because you have a personal relationship with him. Um, there's, a, there's a preacher that I have a lot of respect for, and he preaches against everything. I know I preach against everything. He preaches against everything more than I preach against everything. And I'm, he's against this, and he's against that, and he's against this. And I'm like, well, I don't really like all this stuff because you're just, against, you're just against everything at this point. I don't know that you need to be against these things. And then he was preaching, and he said, but I've asked God for discernment. He says, I've been praying for discernment for the last 20 years. And I think, hmm, maybe he's got something. Could he be wrong? He could be wrong. But what has that gotten me doing? That's got me saying, Lord, I need discernment. Because I can't be going on, well, he said it, so i got to do this because he said, well, no, I, I want to do it because you showed me. Lord, help me. I need discernment. Should I be against these things? Or should I be in favor of these things? I don't know. I need wisdom because the devil, we talk about the devil in Genesis 3, the devil is deceptive and he has ratcheted it up in the last days. There is so much out there now that's deceptive. There is, there are so many, I could, you could put up a list of 15 or 20 Christian songs on a whiteboard and say, is this a good song or a bad song? And every single one of us would at the end would have different setup. This song's good, that one's not. This one's good, that one's not. Movies, TV shows, unless you're just going to throw them all on, no, okay. That's not, that wouldn't be uh, the worst decision to make, but Christian songs, Christian fellowship. I was talking to a guy a couple days ago about, well, he's uh, different things and different preachers, and he starts talking about these, these weirdos that are King James only. It's like, all right, well, how close can I get to this? Where, where should I be in relation to this guy? I said, he's a nice guy. I want to be friends with him but I don't know how close I can get to this. I don't want to be associated with uh, the movement that that's, be that's behind that. I don't want to get wrapped up in that. I don't want to say, well, yes, he's wrong, but he's a nice guy. He's a good person. Well, I know he's a good, well, I don't want to start excusing sin because of my personal relationship with this person. And that's what you got to be careful with, Christian. you got all these things. Does that mean that you just throw out everybody who isn't a 1611 King James only dispensational independent fundamental Bible living Baptist Ruckman affiliated church? <laughs> yeah. I was I'm reading now, I'm reading um Dr. Ruckman's book on um the local church. He says, You start a church in, in some of these towns, he says, your best friend may be a Lutheran minister. He says, because of all the nuts that you gotta deal with and all the people who believe all these different things. I tell you, you get missionaries, they go out on the field, some of them are friends with charismatic people. Why? Because they're in a place where nobody even knows who Jesus Christ is. And they've got, the, they've got people going to the Catholic Church, going out back and praying in the cemetery that their pagan gods would condemn the Baptist preacher. That happens. That still happens. I got a, a friend that had that happen to him. He said that he's got all these Catholics in the town in Mexico that don't want him. So they all go out to the cemetery and they practice all their paganism that was in place before the Catholic Church showed up, and they're doing death rituals on this, on this missionary. He says, well, when you end up in that kind of environment and somebody says, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, but I also speak in tongues, you're not so quick to jump on them. I'm not going to let anybody like that come behind this pulpit, God willing. <laughs> well, God is willing. But in terms of how am I going to be around? I don't know. I need discernment. God, I need help. I need wisdom. I, I got some luxuries here in America. That I do have enough independent fundamental Bible, even God-honoring people I can be around. Maybe I don't need that. I don't know. But I need discernment. And boy, you all need, everybody, you need discernment. You need to try the spirits to know what sort they be because there are some weird spirits out there now. But that's what, what is that? It's judgment. And why do you judge? Well, you judge to keep yourself close to God. But look here. Uh, verse 22, James 1, 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if there be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like to a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Some of you, you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror, say, I look all right. You get yourself cleaned up. You come to church, and somewhere between church and here, something happens. 
and you walk by that mirror out there and you go, whoa, I don't look as, I don't, I don't look the way I did. I got my tie, my tie comes undone all the time. Got to straighten it up, my shirt comes untucked all the time. Yes, I know. <laughs> I am aware of it too. So you all sitting there and you're like, Ben's shirt's untucked again, his shirt's untucked again. Look at it, does he know? Yes, he knows. <laughs> I'm fully aware of it. But you don't just look into a mirror one time and then say, well, I'm good until next week. Sometimes I get here and I go, man, I, I haven't shaved. I look rough. This isn't good. Why? Well, I didn't shave, look in the mirror and say, I look great, and then come back next Sunday and then say, well, I shaved last week. I look fine. What does the Bible say? You're supposed to keep looking in that. How, long, how often do you keep yourself kept up? You look in the perfect law of liberty. Well, look in here to keep yourself spiritually kept up. Am I presentable? Am I where God wants me? And then you have the ability, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, to ask God. Lord, am I right? God, are we close? God, what's going on with this? Um, I think Acts. Let's go to Acts 17 real quick. I believe that's where this is. I believe it's Acts chapter 17. Maybe it's not. Um, let's see here, that's not here. Oh, I'm not going to find it. Uh, but Paul shows up, and he, he comes to, uh, oh, Acts 16, Acts 16. Acts chapter 16, look down in verse 14. It says, in a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the house of, fire, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul, and when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, This is a scary question. If ye have judged us to be faithful to the Lord, come unto my house and abide there. Man, that's a tough question to ask the Apostle Paul. Paul, if you think I'm a faithful Christian, why don't you come stay at my house while you're in town? Well, you can ask God that, Lord, am I? Am I? Am I? God, are you pleased with this? Not God, it's, you know, this didn't happen. Lord, were you pleased with what I did today? Sometimes you get out of the pulpit and I say, God, I butchered that. And God says, you did a good job. That's what I wanted. But Lord, I didn't think, I, I could have, this didn't line up in this reference work and I messed up and I flubbed on this and I couldn't remember that. God, and God goes, it's all right. You witness to somebody, you give them the gospel and you try and they will blow you off and say, God, you know, they didn't get saved. I was, yeah, but you did the best you could. I told you to witness to them told you to hand them a track, and you did, and you said something, and they responded, and they turned you down, but you did what you were supposed to do. Good job. Does God ever tell you good job? Have you ever asked God for an attaboy? It's like, Lord, did I do right there? Because he'll give it to you. He's not just sitting up in there in heaven all the time, just, well, you're not perfect, get out of the way. You're not perfect, get out of the way. You're not perfect, get out of the You look at your children. Look at kids. Do kids do everything perfect? You cook in the kitchen with your children. Do they do everything perfect? Does it come out tasting as good as it would if you just done it yourself? No. What do you do? Well, you did, you did a good job. You tried. Hey, I don't expect you to be perfect. Why? Because you're seven. I don't expect a seven-year-old to be perfect at anything, really. But what do they do? They did their best. They did their best. All right, I'm happy with that. That's how God is with us. Paul said, don't ever forget the fact that you're a child. Don't ever forget that, Christian. Don't ever get to the point where you think you got to be perfect. You got to be exactly right. Everything's got to be exactly right, and you, the, the, the daisies ought to sprout up behind you where you walk, and you ought to just hover. Just walk on. Yeah, I can walk on water, of course. No, you're never going to get there. Never forget that you're a child. Um, that's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Go there really quick. 1 Corinthians ch chapter 13. First Corinthians chapter 13, this is the charity chapter. In verse 11, he says, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You ought to be growing. And you ought to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday. But verse 12, But now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. 
He says, listen, when I was a child, I was like this, but when I became an adult, I put the childish things away. I became more mature about these things. I didn't need this as much. I didn't need that as much. I grew. He says, don't forget, you're looking through a glass darkly. No matter how close you get to God, no matter how much you, time you spend in that Bible, you're always going to be looking through a darkened glass. You're never going to completely get it, completely arrive, and just be there spiritually. He says, it's okay. <laughs> you're always going to be in a sin-cursed world. You're always going to have the devil sit on top. Well, how come I'm still dealing with this temptation? Because you're still breathing. The devil, if you were perfect, the devil would come after you. Um, as a Christian, he said, he says, you need to learn this. He says, when you get in the ministry... When you start doing something for God, you need to understand that the closer you get to God, the closer you get to the devil. The closer you get to God, the more the devil comes after you. The devil never comes after the tribe of Asher. Why? Because they never do anything. You don't hear about the prophets going and prophesying to the children of Asher or to the children of Issachar. Why? Because they're not doing anything. They're just kind of hanging out, just kind of floating around. Well, Judah... Judah is where God's decided to let his seed go through. He cares about Judah. He sends his prophets to you. He says, hey, Judah, wake up. Judah, wake up. Judah, get your heart right. Why? Because you've been serving God. I want you to stay on the right track. I care about you. You've been trying. I'm trying to help you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The closer you get to God, the more the devil's going to come after you. And the more the devil comes after you, the more you're going to struggle. And the more you're going to fight. And the rougher it's going to get sometimes. Okay, take comfort in that. <laughs> the devil's really turning up the heat. Well, I must be doing something right. Praise the Lord. And it's not easy to do, but sometimes, praise the Lord. Uh, what, Paul talks about that. He talks about his thorn in the flesh. Why do I have this? So I don't get proud? Well, thank God for this thing that keeps me from getting proud. I'm going to glory in my thorn in the flesh. I have not figured that out. I'm going to take glory in the thing that, takes, that holds me down and keeps me grounded and just messes me up continuously and just, just eats my lunch. I'm going to take glory in that because it keeps me from getting too proud of what I am and who I am and what God's done with me. Well, thank God I got close enough to him that he decided I needed the thorn in the flesh. That's a rough prayer to pray, but that's the truth. I wish I could get there, but that's where Paul was. Thank God for my thorn in the flesh. I got that close to him that he thought I needed one. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, God talks about judgment. And you judge, you work on yourself, you say, Lord, I just want to help my relationship with you. And God will help you. He'll give you what you need. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look down verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Hey, I know I got my problems. I know I got, I, there's some areas I'm weak and I need some help and I could use some prayer and I'll take it. I'll take all the prayer I can get. But the Bible says that he that is spiritual, well, do you want to be spiritual? I'd like to be spiritual. I like for people to think, I like for God to say that, yeah, that's a spiritual man. You judge everything. Do I want that in my life? Yes or no. Do I want that in my life? Yes or no. Do I want that in my life? Should I do this? Should I be like this? Can I listen to this? Can I act like this? Can I watch this? Can I go here? Can I wear this? Judge everything. Christian, why? You're a Christian. Lord, are you pleased with this? Because God has an opinion about everything. Okay, we'll judge it. Why? Because of the third part, we're not going to uh, go too far, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because of righteousness. Because of these three things, loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. Why does he want you to judge everything? To stay righteous. <laughs> to stay close to him. Why? Because sin separates you from God. The Bible says your iniquities have, have separated you from God. Why? Because two can't walk together unless they're agreed. And if you're going to start sinning, if you're going to become okay with sin, God is not okay with sin. God is not okay with any sin. All right, I'm not okay with any sin either. Do I sin? Yeah, I do. What do I got to do? Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up again. Okay, I'll forgive you. 
uh, there's, a, there's a joke where it says, I, I prayed and asked God for a bicycle, but he doesn't always work like that, so I just stole one and asked for forgiveness. <laughs> well, if you were really sorry, you'd give it back. But well, you've got you to look at the sin in your life and say, okay, I'm against that. I'm fighting that. I don't like that. I, I want to beat this. And you might fight it for the rest of your life, but fight it. Say, this is wrong. The most dangerous sin in your life is the one that does not bother you anymore. The one that God used to convict you about, and you just put it away. Say, no, I'm not, I'm not giving this up. No, God's, no. And you've convinced yourself that God's fine with your sin. That is the most dangerous sin in your life. Why? Because you've accepted it, and now you're off course. Now you're going a different direction than God is. God's going on the straight and narrow, and you've said, well, I've got the straight and narrow plus this. You add anything to the straight and narrow, you're no longer on the straight and narrow. And that's not going to affect your salvation, but it's going to affect your fellowship. Why? Because God doesn't want to be around your sin. He doesn't want any part of it. And if you're going to keep building it up, you're going to build a wall between you and him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look down in verse uh, 33. He says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. This I speak to your shame. He says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. Just trying to do right. I'm just trying to, Lord, just trying to do right. God knows you're just trying to do right. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're going to go through tomorrow. He cares about you. He loves you. His loving kindness towards you. He has it. He, he knows your estate that we are but dust. It's okay. We're just a bunch of dust. We're just, just a bunch of people just doing the best we can. We're just stuck here in the last days where you got the internet trying to mess you up and you got television running all over the place. You got the music industry being weird. You got Christians. Just, you got all kinds of deviations in the Christian church. He knows where you are. He knows what you're dealing with. He knows that the church doors are closing one after the other and old preachers are dying and young men aren't stepping up to replace them. There's not a lot of young Christians that I know that are good Christians. I don't know a ton of them. Uh, I, I met a, a guy the other day, and he's a younger guy, and he's just trying to do a whole bunch for the Lord. I remember thinking, man, there aren't a lot of people like that. I don't know anybody who's just stepped out on faith the way that he's stepped out on the faith. It, it doesn't happen much anymore. You hear all about it with old evangelists. They'll talk about, oh, I got in my car. I didn't have enough money to get from here to there. When was the last time you heard somebody do that? It doesn't happen much anymore. People don't have that level of faith anymore. They're, they're getting complacent. It's, it's, it's slowing down. God knows where you are. He knows what you need. He'll still work on you. He's still going to do something with you if you let him. But you, where you need, you need righteousness in your life. You say, God, I'm just going to do what's right. <laughs> I'm just going to do what's right. Why? Because righteousness is what keeps you in line with God. That's, just, that's God's nature. God does everything right all the time, always. And God, for being a perfectionist, does a very good job of putting up with us non-perfectionists. I am not a perfectionist. I, not by a long shot. Not in anything. I wish I was. I try. I work really hard. I work on, I work on being a perfectionist in Bible doctrine. That's it. When I study and I preach up here, I do everything I can to make sure, okay, this is right the way I'm saying it, because I don't want to lead you down the wrong way, give you a false impression of God. But other things, I'm not a perfectionist. And you know what people who are perfectionists can't stand? is people who don't do everything exactly the way that they want them to all the time. It drives them nuts. If you know a perfectionist, you know what I'm talking about. And you all know a perfectionist. They just can't stand anything to not be perfect. God's a perfectionist, but he's got a lot of grace with us. Why? Because he understands our estate. He understands what we are. He understands where we are. He knows that you don't have some of the advantages that people used to have when it comes to their walk with God. He knows you're at the end of the church age, and all ages end in apostasy. They all end with things falling apart, things winding down, things just not going the way they're supposed to. God's take, as his whole is taking his hand slowly off this country, more and more all the time. You don't have as much of God on this country as you used to. <laughs> I'm reading the book on, on uh, he, he's got a whole chapter on building the church. He's talking about how, you, yeah, you go on, you get, you know, 15 or 16 saved families. 15 or 16 saved families? What? If you get one person saved, that's, I mean, it's, it's always a blessing, but you usually you get one person saved, the husband gets saved, the wife doesn't. The kid gets saved, the parents don't. 
The wife gets saved, the husband doesn't want no part of it. To see a whole family get saved and get in church, it happens still, but not much. God, God can, absolutely God can still work like that. It doesn't happen much. It doesn't happen the way it used to. You don't get to go out on soul winning every week and see somebody get saved. Stay in there. Why? God loves you. He cares about you. And if you just get out, get worn out, get worn down, give up, whatever, then God doesn't have anything to work with. It's a lot easier to work with someone that's moving to get them on the right path than somebody who's just sitting still, I'm just sitting still doing nothing. I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. I'm just, I'm just on my own. I'm just not going to sit here under preaching. I'm just not going to be reading my Bible. And there are so many Christians that know, they know their Bible. They know their Bible. They sat in good churches for years, years, years. Just got out. What are they doing? Nothing. What's God doing with them? Nothing. Why? They just got out. And that's going to be the tendency. It's just whatever. Just let the world go. Let it do what it's, it's going to do it anyways. Why am I trying? You're supposed to try, even though the world's going to do it, what it wants to do anyways. That's what we're here for. The world's always been on this path. The world's always been on the same track. It's always been headed the same direction. It's just a little bit closer today than it was yesterday. Still stick in there. Still fight. Still put your forehead against theirs and say, no, I'm not giving in. I'm not backing down. I'm not changing. Why? God loves me too much. He's too good to me. He's too kind. <laughs> He's too loving. Jeremiah talks about God, he talks about his loving kindness, he talks about his judgment, and he talks about his righteousness. And he says, for these things I delight, saith the Lord. God loves those things. That's why he is that way with us. He judges us because he loves us. And if you judge yourself, you don't have to worry about God judging you. And you're a lot more merciful yourself. Amen. Say, so God, I want you to, I just, I want to be close to you. Why? I got to judge myself. Why? So I can be righteous. I gotta judge myself by that book so I can be righteous. God, you love me. I know you love me. Help me love you. And he'll work with you. God works with your shortcomings. But you gotta take them to the Lord and say, Lord, I just need help. God, I just need you to do something. I can't do it myself. And he'll get you through it. Maybe just one week at a time. Maybe just limping along. I'm just limping along. All right. Keep limping along. Just keep pushing. Just keep driving. Just keep driving. Just keep going. Why? you got a personal relationship with him. You give him enough time, he'll fix it. He'll help you. He'll work on you. He'll give you what you need. He'll get you out of this. He'll get you through. It's all right. That's God. He says, but let him the glory of glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. You know God. And if your perception of God is something other than this, then maybe you don't know God as well as you think you do. Uh, look, <laughs> I'm the one teaching Sunday school. I know what's going on in Habakkuk with the wrath of the wine press of Almighty God and the whirlwind and the fire and the, and the overflowing scourge. I know, yeah, I know. But that God is this God. And in the middle of all the death and judgment and destruction that's going on, Jeremiah 9, 23 walks in and just says, this is how I want to be with you. He wants to be like this with his people, but he can't be because of the sin that they have. We've gone through all that in Judah. He wants this kind of relationship. He cares. This is how he wants to be. This is the kind of, why? That's what he cares about. His loving kindness and judgment and righteousness. That's what's important to him. And if you don't know God along those lines, then get in your Bible and learn him. And get on your knees and learn him. And get busy for God and learn God and learn what he's like. And I would say it's a joyous relationship. It'll get you through. It'll lift you up. It'll move you along. It'll get you past things. And it'll give you what you need when you need it. And that's the God of the Bible. <laughs> that's why the more you get to know him, the longer you're in that relationship, the better you get to understand him, the more you'll love him. And there's a, the, the movement is, well, I just, if I stay busy and I stay in church and I stay working all the time, then that's, that's being a Christian. It's not. <laughs> What's being a Christian? It's knowing God. And when you build that relationship with God, you will be busy. You will be all those things. But it's based on understanding him first. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, God. Thank you, Lord, for being gentle with us, for loving us, God, and loving all over us, Lord, and, and giving us more than we deserve, Lord. And, and 
being kind, Lord, in your relationship with us, God. Thank you for being gentle with me, Lord. Thank you for, for, for picking me up when I need it, for smacking me upside the head, Lord, when I need it, Lord, for being gentle, Lord, when I need it. God, I pray you'd help us as, as Christians, every person in here, Lord, to, to love you more. Lord, to understand your loving kindness, understand your judgment, understand your righteousness, God, and to live it. Lord, I pray we'd be a, an encouragement and a help to each other, God, that we'd all draw nearer to you together, and we'd be more like you together, and we'd go out and do something in this lost and dying world, Lord, and we'd be able to make a difference, Lord, as a church, and be able to, to change some lives and, and help people, God. God, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for all you do. We pray you come back soon and get us, God, take us out of this mess, and we could know you, Lord, as you are fully. I pray you please be with the pastor this evening, be with Miss Serena, Lord, and all that they're going through and the struggles they have. I pray you'd have your hand on them, lift them up, Lord, bless them, comfort them, give them what they need, Father. We love you. We pray you bring us back again on Wednesday. In Jesus' name, amen.